Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Upbit. Now, back in 2006, Intel had a CPU finally to combat the Athlon X2. The Core 2 Duo was a complete rethink of desktop and server CPU architecture. With the idea of simplifying the pipelines on the CPU, in my opinion, its release made a legendary CPU that changed the direction of Intel's processor design for the future. However, unfortunately, their sales department may have had the worst naming scheme ever. Still, to this day, I still need to look up what exactly a Core 2 Duo E-Series CPU is. Now, if you don't know what we do on this channel, well, most of, our bit, most of our videos basically is getting an older system just like this and trying to run newer games. Well, today is no different. We have today on the off bit, the last of the Core 2 Duos that could be found. Now, we're gonna be gaming on it, we're gonna be overclocking it, and we're gonna game on it some more, and then I'm gonna tell you what I exactly think about this CPU. So stick around and find out. The Core 2 Duo we're using today in our system is the E8400. Based on one of the last Core 2 architectures, Wharfdale, the CPU is based on the LGA 775 platform and was built on the 45 nanometer node process. Sporting a 3 GHz stock clock and 6 MB of level 2 cache, it is literally half a Core 2 quad Q9650. Now previously we've had overclocked a Core 2 Xeon E5450 which is similar to the Q9650. We overclocked that system to 3.9 GHz with brilliant results. We're hoping that our overclock today of 4.2 GHz will make the CPU just shine and something that we can hope that we can game with new titles once again. The system we have set up to test our CPU today has 8 gig of DDR2 800 megahertz RAM from Corsair. The motherboard we're using is the Gigabyte GA EP45 UD3L. This is an LGA 775 motherboard running the Intel P45 chipset. This motherboard is a great overclocking motherboard as we found today. Now the GPU we're using today is the GTX 660 from Gigabyte. This variant we're using today from Gigabyte is the GV-N66OC-2GD. This comprises of T-Gig of GDDR5 and a stock clock GPU of 1033MHz that can boost up to 1098. We are using the standard disk drive as usual today. We have the 120GB Western Digital Green SSD for our operating system. We also have our 256 Silicon Power A55 SSD for some of our games. And some of our bigger games are kept on our 1TB Western Digital Green Magnetic Drive. We'll be running Windows 10 version 21H2. Now let's check out how well this CPU benchmarked in our benchmarks. In SEMZIP, our E8400 Core 2 Duo increased in performance by about 30% in the single core score. And in the multi-core, it increased by a whopping 37% increase in performance. Our single core score beating the rest of the Core 2 based CPUs, the second gen i3 and the Athlon 2 X2 CPU. The overclocked Core 2 Duo E8400 even caught up to the multi-core score of the Q6600, and that is a quad-core CPU. And that's quite impressive, really. Moving on to the CPUID benchmarks, we're also seeing very similar results once again from the last benchmark. The single core score overclock gained an extra 41% increase in performance, which is actually, wow, that, that is amazing. And the multi-core score even got a 42.5 increase in performance. Like, what the flip's going on here? This is insane. How is this CPU gaining extra performance points for the multi-core score? Well, I do have a hypothesis for that, but it's particularly technical and I don't want to get into it right now. So anyway, once again, we're sitting on the doorstep of the Q6600, but this time our humble E8400 is sitting close to i3-2120. This CPU has definitely given us some nice surprises today. And we haven't even got into the games yet. Finally for the CPU, the E8400 in Cinebench R15 once again shined. It had a 41% increase in performance with the overclock. Once again, we are sitting close to the Q6600 and still not all that far away from the i3-2120, which I must remind you, that there is basically two generations ahead in architecture. Now, that is crazy. This is going to be extremely interesting once we crack the games. So let's keep moving on and start looking at our GTX 660 with our setup. 
in Cinebench, the GTX 660 scored 63.14 frames per second, getting an extra 20% approximately boost in performance, which really makes a big difference in this benchmark. There is a lot of CPU computing power happening for this GPU benchmark. Moving on to Unity in Heaven, the GTX 660 scored very similar to the non-overclocked E8400, with only a 0.5% increase difference in performance. Still, overall, it did well. It did come close to the GTX 770, but I must say, we don't think that system was well set up, so we're going to disregard that score for the GTX 770 and the Venom 2. Finally, in 3D Mark, we saw an 8% increase in performance with the CPU overclock, and the GPU did beat the RX 550 and the GTX 750. This GPU will have more performance than our CPU, so we can just see exactly how much this CPU can actually produce for the games we're going to be playing. So, without any further ado, let's get out of the benchmarks and jump into those games. The first game we have today off the rank is Sea of Thieves. We ran Sea of Thieves at 540p on cursed settings. Now, the first game you're going to play inside of Sea of Thieves with the 3 GHz Core 2 Duo is the game I like to call the teleporting game. Fun. Eventually, this will stop doing this as bad as it loads in the whole island. Sea of Thieves without an overclock was pretty much unplayable, in my opinion, though it did give us bursts of playable sections here and there. But you never got away from the riddled load lag. Just like a bad record, it goes round and round over and over again. However, if you really want to persist, you still could play this game and you'd get some sort of gaming experience, but I would imagine it'd be pretty frustrating, as that's what I've discovered. Frame rates for Sea of Thieves on a 3 GHz Core 2 Duo E8400 was an average frame rate of 29.1 frames per second. Our minimum frame rate hit a woeful 0.2 frames per second. Our maximum frame rate hit 61.8 frames per second. And our 0.1% lows hit the woeful 0.2 frames per second once again. With the overclock, the game did get somewhat improved by giving us a 30 frames per second playable game experience. Though it did still suffer from those low legs and this became a problem at outposts, new islands and those sea battles. Overall, it didn't seem all that bad, it just came frustrating in the middle of those sea battles when it just decided to lag out. The frame rates for the Sea of Thieves with the overclock of 4.2 GHz on a Core 2 Duo E8400 was an average frame rate of 34.8 frames per second. Our minimum frame rates hit the low and woeful 0.1 frames per second and a maximum frame rate of 61.6 frames per second. Our 0.1% lows hit 0.1 frames per second as well. Did get an average of 5 frames per second increase in performance, which is actually not a lot, but for most of it, that load lag time seemed to be just a lot less and a lot less frequent. It really was quite impressive that this game is playable with a Core 2 Duo. Though we've overclocked the legs of this thing, the fact still remains this is a CPU that was released in 2008. Now don't get me wrong, this is nowhere near perfect, but it is actually playable. Jumping into Fortnite, running the stock clock on the E8400 of 3GHz, we run Fortnite at 1280x720 with low settings and DirectX 9 performance mode at 100% render. Now this game ran actually quite terrible overall. It really never loaded in the models until some time had passed. The load lag at times was so massive and it would probably cost you the game eventually at some point. Something in a battle royale you just can't afford is to miss out a whole section of a fight. Just like this. Now frame rates for Fortnite with the Core 2 Duo E8400 at 3 GHz, we got an average frame rate of 48.7 frames per second. Our minimum frame rate hit 0.1 frames per second and our maximum frame rate hit 96.5 frames per second. Our 0.1% lows hit a frame rate of 0.1 frames per second. Now, the game did actually try to run well, though it did suffer from the CPU just holding back this GPU the whole time. Fortunately, with all Battle Royale games, one of their main mechanics is keeping you to move, and that alone is going to hurt you with this Core 2 Duo. However, if we just bump the clock up, what do we get? So we managed to overclock the Core 2 Duo E8400 to 4.2 GHz. Now, this overclock really did make a big difference though the big load spikes did still happen, but much less of the time, and when they did happen, it was a lot shorter when they occurred. 
Overall, the game did play fairly well. It did still suffer from the load stutters, and aiming guns did feel a bit janky. But that may just be me. And it's probably something that you would probably get used to over time if you were using these settings on a regular occurrence. Now, the frame rates for the overclock Core 2 Duo E8400. We got an average frame rate of 64.1 frames per second. Our minimum frame rates hit that wonderful and woeful 0.2 frames per second. Our maximum frame rates hit a nice 105.9 frames per second. And our 0.1% lows hit that woeful 0.2 frames per second once again. Though we did see a significant improvement in the average frame rate and the game was actually much more playable. In fact, I managed to finish in second place for this round. So, there you have it. You can play Fortnite on a Core 2 Duo, but there's going to be much sacrifice and there's got to be a lot of overclocking also in the process. Next, we tried running GTA 5. We set the game to 1280 by 720 with low settings. We found the game constantly pausing every few seconds just briefly to load the world in. The game also did start falling behind in the loading high detail models and textures. As you can see here, that the world just started disappearing around us. Now the frame rates for GTA 5 on the E8400 with the stock clock, we got a frame rate of 57.7 frames per second on average. Our minimum frame rate hit 0.8 frames per second on average, and our maximum frame rate hit 249.4 frames per second. Our 0.1% lows hit a frame rate of 0.8 frames per second. So like I said, this game is pretty much unplayable, though it teased us with some smooth frame rates followed by giant load spikes. To be honest, not a great gaming experience and something that's going to be a bother while you play this game. And with the overclock on the Core 2 Duo to 4.2 GHz in GTA 5, it did net us some better performance. Though the game did suffer from the same problems as before, but not as bad. You had to work a lot harder to make the world disappear from underneath you. The frame rates for GTA 5 with a 4.2 GHz overclock on the E8400 gave us an average frame rate of 67.4 frames per second. Our minimum frame rates hit 15.3 frames per second and our maximum frame rate hit a whole 239.4 frames per second. The 0.1% lows fell to 1.6 frames per second. But if you do want to persist on playing GTA 5 on a system like this, your best bet is to run it with the overclock because this gave us some playable experiences at times. Just don't move around the world so much or too quickly, and you might be actually okay. Next game we played on our list was Counter-Strike Global Offensive. We ran Counter-Strike Global Offensive at 1920x1080 on low settings. The game ran rather well on this setup, and we could have played this game all day long with this system. However, it did not run perfect, and we did not get that great frame rate, but it did do a good enough job, and it did it consistently for CSGO on E8400 running at the stock clock of 3 GHz we had an average frame rate of 34.1 frames per second. Our minimum frame rates hit 14.6 frames per second and our maximum frame rate hit a 62.1 frames per second. Our 0.1% lows hit 1.7 frames per second. With the overclock, Counter-Strike Global Offensive did run a lot better. It gave it that missing shine that we felt was missing in the game with the standard clock. It did deliver a better frame rate and it suffered a lot less jitters, in my opinion anyway. The frame rates for CSGO with the overclock of 4.2 GHz on the Core 2 Duo E8400. We got an average frame rate of 48.0 frames per second. Minimum frame rates hit 9.7 frames per second and our maximum frame rate hit a whopping 167.5 frames per second. Our 0.1% lows hit 1.6 frames per second. As you can see here, the overclock really did push up the average frame rate. We also had a bit more stuff happening in this run when we played this round. But at the end of the day, the game ran a lot more smoother with the overclock in the gameplay. Good as new. Moving on to Overwatch, this game did play okay with the settings of 1280 by 720 at low settings. The game never got amazing frame rates, but it did deliver good enough frame rates for fun gameplay. Now the frame rates for Overwatch on the 3 GHz E8400 with no overclock was an average frame rate of 38.1 frames per second. Our minimum frame rates hit 9.8 frames per second and our maximum frame rate hit 73.9 frames per second. Our 0.1% lows hit a frame rate of 3.3 frames per second. As you can see with the benchmarks, the game ran okay. Let's check out the improvement when we put the overclock on it. With the overclock, we did see an improvement. The game did feel smoother. It really made the game feel like we had better and more accurate and precise control. 
Now the frame rates for the Overclock E8400 Core 2 Duo at 4.2 GHz. We had an average frame rate of 45.9 frames per second. Our minimum frame rate hit 9.8 frames per second and our maximum frame rate hit 78.4 frames per second. The 0.1% lows had a frame rate of 4.3 frames per second. Now as the data shows, the game really did quite well. Even being a dual core Core 2 Duo, we also found even the stock box of the Core 2 Duo ran Overwatch quite playable. This really is a great game to play on a Core 2 Duo system if you are willing to drop those details and resolutions back and you can deal with those odd bits of load lag and stutters. Next we jumped into Dota 2. We ran Dota 2 at 1920x1080 on low settings. This game really felt quite good on this system, giving us nearly perfect gameplay for what I could perceive it anyway. The frame rates for Dota 2, we had an average frame rate of 56.5 frames per second. The minimum frame rate hit 36.2 frames per second and our maximum frame rate hit 83.9 frames per second. Our 0.1% lows had a frame rate of 8 frames per second. The numbers show the game really did not struggle, though the average frame rate did not deliver that 60 frames per second gameplay that we always like to see, it was actually pretty close to it. With the overclock applied to the CPU, the game felt pretty similar to the naked eye. We did notice it did run a little better on first load, but overall it really did feel quite the same. The frame rates for Dota 2 on the Core 2 Duo E8400 with an overclock of 4.2 GHz. We had an average frame rate of 64.6 frames per second and a minimum frame rate of 39.1 frames per second. Our maximum frame rate hit 96.9 frames per second and we had a 0.1% low frame rate of 18.5 frames per second. As the data shows, the game did run a lot better with an extra 10 frames per second on the overclock. As well as having that 10 frames per second on the overclock, we did notice that it really didn't have any load lag. Now Dota 2 is actually quite a good game to play on a Core 2 Duo system, especially with the E8400. As we saw with the stop clocks, we would get an average frame of 56.5 frames per second. Even the frame rate on the 0.1% lows was 8 frames per second, it's actually pretty good. We don't even need the overclock for this game to run well, so having that overclock is kind of a bit of a luxury. Last game we're playing today is Minecraft Bedrock Edition for Windows 10 ran Minecraft at 1920x1080 with default settings. The game ran quite smooth and we did notice a bit of input lag from both the mouse and keyboard. The game also suffered from failing to load enough of the world chunks in, giving us the ability to see through the world and fly over parts of the world that had not fully loaded in yet, as you can see here on the screen. Now, our frame rates for Minecraft Bedrock Edition on the stock clock on the E8400, we got an average frame rate of 57.5 frames per second. We had a minimum frame rate of 25.4 frames per second and our maximum frame rate hit 62.5 frames per second. Our 0.1% lows hit 5.2 frames per second. Now, the frame rate did show pretty good on the data, but it did struggle to load in enough information in time. To the overclock, we found that the input lag dramatically decreased, but we still seem to be suffering from those chunks not fully loading in the world. Frame rates for Minecraft on the 4.2 GHz overclock on the E8400 gave us an average frame rate of 59.4 frames per second. Our minimum frame rate hit 42.6 frames per second and our maximum frame rate hit 62.4 frames per second. Our 0.1% lows hit 10 frames per second. Now Minecraft did run a lot better on the overclock, but the only reason we found that was it to be the input lag was actually a lot less. The benchmarks really showed not a great difference in the average frame rates, but it did have a bigger difference on the minimum frame rates with the 1% and 0.1% lows. Minecraft could be played on this system, but be prepared to really bring the chunks back on the draw distances. The game has gone through a big overhaul just of recent, and the performance in the lesser threaded CPUs seem to take the biggest hits with the performance, and especially with the loading in the world, which is what we're suffering here. Though it is still amazing that this game still ran quite smooth, though if you disregard those rendering issues with loading those chunks in the world, it's not a big problem then. However, playing survival with this probably will be less an issue since you don't move around the world so much, since most of the time we spend flying and that CPU is working its little legs off. 
Now, in conclusion, the E8400 really is one of the best and last Core 2 duos ever made. Though modern gaming on such a CPU as this E8400 will give you limited options. However, this CPU with a heavy overclock really did give us some big surprises. The CPU did perform better in its multi-core performance than single core, which actually was quite interesting. I do believe this attributes to how the L2 cache is actually shared on the Core 2 Duo architecture, but we won't get into that now. Now, I must be honest, this CPU really did shine with the overclock. The CPU with a 1.2 gigahertz overclock running at 4.2 gigahertz almost caught up to the Core 2 Quad Q6600 in its multi-core performance. And that is a quad core CPU which is actually quite impressive. Also, yes, you couldn't play all new titles and relevant games of today on this CPU, but honestly, you could play Sea of Thieves, Overwatch, Minecraft, Dota 2 and CSGO. And there's probably a lot more. Some of these games did play fine on the Core 2 Quad, e, sorry, the Core 2 Duo E8400 at its stock clock of 3 gigahertz, but it played so, so much better with its overclock. Now, if you're planning to do an overclock on a Core 2 Duo with a big overclock, do yourself a favor and get yourself a cooler that's a bit more substantial than the stock cooler. Now, we did find at times that the stock cooler just didn't cut it and it was actually quite questionable. It's also worth mentioning that your ambient temperature and where you live, it's gonna vary the distance and how well that cooler is gonna perform. So if you're moving away from that stock cooler, it's gonna be a lot better in the long run. Now we use the GTX 660 in this test to ensure that we could extract the maximum capability of the E8400. Now, I think you'd be better off pairing an E8400 with a GTX 650 or a GTX 550 Ti in my opinion, especially with the overclocked. Now, just also I'd like to say the biggest thing we found from this setup, and this is the bottom line for this video, is it is actually quite impressive that we can still play relevant games on this E8400. Though it didn't play perfectly, it was still actually possible. Now, I don't know what you guys think, but in my mind, that is nothing short of being staggering. So anyway, that is our conclusion to our video once again. So thank you for tuning in here and watching us here at the Offbit. Now I'd like to thank our Patreon supporters for their contributions. You guys really are helping out make video content here. Now, if you really want to help out here on the Offbit, you can easily do so just by hitting that subscribe button down here. So please, if you, want, if you like watching what we do here, and you haven't hit that subscribe button, hit that subscribe button. And if you like this video, hit that like button. Cool. Well, that's us here today on the Offbit. If you want to catch up and see more videos, you can see us on Patreon. We do have other videos that we've filmed. You can check our backlog on our YouTube catalog. But that's it for today. And thank you once again. And we'll catch all you guys next time on the Offbit.